The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Now, uh, this is how we left on Tuesday. We got to this point where we had put a particle in a box. We put a, a quantum mechanical particle in a box, and it was an infinite square well. And what's this called? Energy levels. And what's really weird about them? Yeah. Meaning, like, that you have this one here, and then you have another energy here. Can it have energy in between? No. Can that quantum particle be in between? No, in energy. And so the question was, can we connect that to things like, like what we see in the universe, like those spectral lines? So what I want to do, there, there's a little bit more we need to do to do that connection. And so, so I want to spend some time today just going through that and going to the hydrogen atom, because this is not the hydrogen atom. It's not an infinite well. And then, um, and then from the hydrogen atom, um, we'll sort of talk about how just from that, just by solving for the hydrogen atom, we, we literally have this, this incredibly deep understanding of the entire periodic table in all of chemistry. Okay, So it's a pretty powerful thing to do. So we're going to start with a little bit of review and then this real world example. And then I got to tell you a few things that are really important, like you have this thing called spin. So we'll talk about that. We'll end with that and, and sort of talk about how from this solution, you get this, which is pretty awesome, pretty amazing. OK? So some review. So we first, uh, we, we went through this on Tuesday. So why, why did people even need quantum mechanics? Well, because things were failing and crumbling and catastrophizing all around them, right? Um, and so how long is the, so, cl so classical atom, oh, no, this was the, yeah, there's a classical atom. Photoelectric effect was one of them. Who can explain what's, what happened here? These are some of the reasons why we needed a new theory after 400 years. What's going on with the photoelectric effect? Anyone remember? Yeah. Oh. A description of the phenomenon or, or why it happened? Yes. Uh, OK, so um, basically you take some light, you shine it at a metal, and yeah. a bunch of electrons come off. And if you okay. increase the intensity of the light, the number of electrons coming off increases, but not the energy, which was sort of counterintuitive. Why was that counterintuitive? Uh, because if light's not a particle, if it's just like a, a wave, wave, then you expect you know, you're shooting more light at it. That's more energy. So if an electron gets hit by a bunch of light, you'd think it you know, would get a bunch of energy right. and shoot off with a higher energy, but it doesn't. Um, and the solution was that uh, the photons you know, are produced by electrons changing energy levels or something like that. And so they come in uh, discrete packets of energy. And yeah. so when they hit an electron, they shoot it off at some particular energy. And what's that? Frequency dependent. It, which is dependent on the frequency. Exactly. That's exactly right. So does everybody see that? So the, this was called the photoelectric effect. And it, it was the reason Einstein was given the Nobel Prize, right, um, is a very important explanation of this very confusing effect, which is that you increase the intensity, but the energy of those electrons, see what's happening? You're shining light on a piece of metal, and electrons fly off. And you can measure how much energy those electrons have. And you increase the intensity of light, and they don't have any more energy which was really bizarre if light is a wave. What Einstein said is, no, actually, um, oh, but it does depend on the, on the frequency of the light. So that makes sense if light can be considered as particles of zero mass, that's weird, um, that have an energy associated with their frequency. Okay, So that was really important. The energy of a particle, the energy of something you thought was a wave, light, actually, um, can be considered as a particle associated with the frequency, have, have the energy of a particle associated with that frequency. And then the, what was the classical atom? What was, what's wrong with this one? How long do we live 
in a classical world? How long, can, what's the most we could live in a classical world? 10 to the minus 12 seconds. It's game over. Why? What's happening? Why? What's happening? So it's accelerating, and we know that an accelerating charge radiation, and it loses energy. And if it loses energy, it should just spiral in. And that takes about 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So we know that's not true either. Actually, there, I, I wanted to put this out there. This is um, uh, from Wikipedia. And it's a sort of explanation of that. And so if you want to understand more and read more about the classical atom, well, get a book on Leonard Weichert potentials. I'm sure just the name alone is inspiring you guys to want to dig deep. Um, and those are the ones. That's what you can do um, to get the time-varying EM field for a point charge in arbitrary motion. But look at that. They're not corrected for quantum mechanical effects. Right? So you, that's what was such a problem. This was right around 1900. Right? So they had it, but then they tried to apply it to an atom. And here's what happens. It's accurate, but breaks down at the quantum level. Quantum mechanics sets important constraints on the ability of a particle to emit radiation, i.e., it doesn't in an atom. <laughs> right. So this is a, I, some, sometimes I think this is kind of interesting to look at. Basically, the, so we have this problem that an atom will sort of self-destruct and the electron will just spiral down. What, do, what the solution really, if you think about it, is it doesn't do that anymore. Right. Now, why? Well, because of the fact that Particles are waves, and waves are particles. And it comes from the quantization. So I want to make sure that we're all on that page um, by the end of today, that we all kind of see that. So that's, that's the reason. It's because particles can be both waves and uh, particles. Waves can be waves and particles. Everything is one happy family. Can't we all just get along? Here, here are some particles going through slits. Now, what's happening here? That, this is actually, you could think of this as a particle, or it kind of looks like a water wave, doesn't it? But see, that's the whole point. That's what particles are. Right? So what's happening here? Somebody, can somebody explain what's, what, why I'm showing this? What's going on? Got on the left, how many slits? And on the right, what's the difference? Interference. Yes. What's interference? Yeah. So that you get two waves coming out of it. But look, the same particle creates no interference here because it just bubbles through. But if you have two slits, it can be it can create two little waves. Right? And those interfere, and they cause complex behavior. And that is what blew people away. And, and oh, by the way, you can see that there's also some really cool interference going on in the backscattering from the edges, because you get little scattering off the edges on both cases. But what we're looking at is what's happening over here. And so it's just really weird that you could throw particles through slits, and they were like water waves, not like particles. Right? So that was another. Um, really bizarre experiment. And, um, and again, you know, one of the big important stepping stones was the fact that you could describe the energy of a particle by its frequency. And then de Broglie came and said, actually, not just light. No, everything, all matter, can be considered as both a particle and a wave. Okay, this is stuff we, we talked about Tuesday. And so what that means is that I have a wavelength. What's my wavelength? 35. 10 to the minus 35. But I'm OK with that. I feel that quantumness right here. Oh, here. I feel it somewhere within. But see, when things are really small, like an electron, which is this part of the class, we care about those electrons, and I motivated that on Tuesday, and we'll come back to that as we go through examples. So if I want to know about an electron, well, that's a really small thing. And you see, so it's wavelength. And we talked about this Tuesday. The wavelength associated with the particle 
is about the same size as like the distances the particle sort of goes out for a walk on, on a daily basis, otherwise known as its chemical bond. If you're an electron, you kind of walk along this chemical bond, right? That's sort of what you do. And um, you know, if you're in a bonding situation, um, and that distance of that walk is roughly the same as, as your wavelength, as your wave nature. Your wave nature-ness is like important then, right? And so because of that, we can't describe it without quantum mechanics. You have to have a, a, a way of describing it. And, and it has to be something that is based on a wave, right? So that's, that's the breakthrough. And I, I'll, I'll go through that again just sort of quickly. Um, but you know what, what we came out with is the fact that, OK, so particles are waves. So they have wave functions. And this wave function is what we'll be solving for. This is what we want in this part of the class. We want that, right? Um, and, and so it'll have some form. And we showed a few forms. And I'll show you more today. But we showed a few for like a particle in a box, right? That had like a cosine. And then it had like you know one node in the middle. Um, and, but what's amazing about this is, is, is that this has no meaning we know of. We do not understand what this means. So you have this like, intimate function that describes the particle. And we don't, know, we don't know how to interpret it. The big breakthrough came in, knowing, in, in, in making the connection that the square of that function is meaningful. OK? But that's pretty cool, right? So think about like if I had like a position Wait, you have this. In, you did classical molecular dynamics, right? So you have like the position of the particle. That's a function of time. Imagine saying that that has no meaning, or you don't know what it means, only the square of it, right? So something as fundamental as the wave itself that is the solution to the equation to Rf equals ma, which is Schrodinger, something as fundamental as that, we don't know what it means. But we do know what its square means. And what does the square mean? Probability. Probability. So tell me, tell me a little more about that. Probability. Yeah. So what? Like, tell me. This is a particle, right here. You're starting to see it. I can tell. I can see that you're starting to see it. I can feel the excitement about this too in the room. It's tangible. This is a particle. You see this now, not as a wave, not as a particle. You see it as both. Now, if this is a particle, and that's what I'm going to show you a little video on in a sec. But if this is a particle, where is it? But I mean, I know that it can be a particle again. We know it can go back and forth. That's what it did when you send it through the two slits. It became a wave, then it became a particle. So I, can I say that it's spread out? Is it spread out? How do I interpret that? Yeah. Take a Good. That's that's kind of that's that's sort of the way that I like to look at it. Is yeah, I mean the particle is in a way you can think about it as spread out um, until you measure it, and sort of everywhere in here because it's not a there's no here here. There's only a certain amount of chance to be here, here. So I have a kind of big chance if I measure where it is of finding it here. And then I have no chance of finding it here. And then a sort of medium chance here and a big chance there, right, if I measure it. So that's really what these functions mean. And those functions are the ones that we solve for to find out where electrons are. And th where those electrons are is what is absolutely critical to doing a whole lot of material science, right? As I mentioned on Tuesday, and as we'll talk about when we when we do, you know, when we apply this to problems. And that's what you get. You get bizarre distributions of probabilities. Okay? Here's an electron thrown into a wall that is infinite, and here's an electron thrown into a wall that's finite. So that's my quantum mechanical ball. Did I show this Tuesday? I don't think I did. 
Right? So if it's thrown into an infinite wall, it actually can't go through. The probability, we worked this out. If you have an infinite boundary here, we talked about that Tuesday, there's zero, you can't have any wave function. It ha the only solution is zero. So it can't penetrate at all, so it completely bounces back. Although look at the weird things it does when it bounces back. That's the wave function of a ball thrown into a wall. Or if you want, a potential thrown into a material. I mean, an, an electron thrown into a material. But over here, you see it's not infinite, and all kinds of interesting things happen. It does bounce back in a similar way, but some of it goes through. What's that called? Or tunneling, right? And you better believe that this is an effect we use in technology all the time. Tunneling, right, of charges. Very important, right? If I take my macroscopic ball and I throw it, or if I just run myself with a helmet on into the wall, how much of me is going to tunnel? What is enough in that example? <laughs> That's what I, um, right? So why aren't I tunneling if I run into that wall? <laughs> I'm not running fast enough. That's actually, that's, that's, that's true. Um, I'm pretty slow. But, um, but the thing is that uh, um, there's another reason. What, what is it about me that is really different here. I'm big, and so what else is, what's, what does that mean? What's small? Your wave Your wave length. My wave function. My wavelength, not my wave function. My wave function is everywhere, but it just doesn't really spread out that much, because the wavelength of me is 10 to the minus 35 meters, and remember, what, when quantum matters is when your wavelength is sort of on the same scale, roughly, as the stuff you're you're involved with. And I'm involved with a thing that's a meter over there. So if I'm 35 orders of magnitude smaller in my wavelength, there's not going to be any quantum effects. You won't tunnel very often. <laughs> not enough to make it worth trying. Salute. OK? Now, here's the goofy video, which is kind of fun. So I'll just play it, and then we'll move on. Gotta love the music. A true giant of quantum revolution was Werner Heisenberg. And from the vagueness of positions of electrons in De Bruyne's standing wave orbits, he drew a tremendous insight which he stated like this. The more precisely the position is determined, the less precisely the momentum is known. And vice versa. And while it may sound like a bunch of gobbledygook, it was the insight necessary to understand how an object can be both a particle and a wave. This single statement led to the understanding that subatomic particles can disappear and reappear in another place. That's really weird. And they can do this without existing in the intervening space. That's really weird. When an electron is trapped inside an atom, Places it can disappear and reappear include specific locations around the nucleus. And that makes it look like a shell. Basic particles can also be in more than one place at a time if the time is brief enough. An electron can travel from here to there along all possible paths simultaneously. And even more astounding, these particles can appear out of the nothingness of space, exist for an extremely brief instant, and then disappear. Scientists call them virtual particles. They may be virtual, but they can have very real effects. All this jumping around makes particle descriptions so inexact. Existence itself is inexact at these tiny scales. The question is often asked, what is it that is waving when a particle is described as a wave? And after a lot of hem-hawing around the issue, the right answer is, 
existence is waving. That's deep. The particle is jumping around, coming into and out of existence. And those places where the wave crests are maximal are the places where the particle materializes most of the time. While the places where the crests are minimal are the places the particle avoids. The wave is a map of the particle's existence. And as the wave changes, the particle changes as well. There you go. I, I, I love these kinds of videos. And not just for the soundtracks, because those are pretty cool. But um, I, I, I think that, you know, it, so he got a little bit ahead of where I want to be, but does everybody see that, like, that weirdness? Is everybody getting a feel for it? Okay. He said something that's mind-blowing. He said, what did he, what did he say that I said was really deep? Anybody remember? <laughs> Existence is, well, yeah. Oh, actually, there were so many things. <laughs> You're going to have to see this again, right? And again, this is one of those things. You take this with Dr. Quantum. Was it Dr. Quantum? You take this video with you, too. To the bars, to the dorms. I don't, you know, wherever you're going to do your next social thing. And you just, you know, you just see what the response is. You, you ask what they can, you know, what their opinion is. And it's a great way to engage with people. <laughs> yeah. Is, is Sorry? That is a good um, question, and yes, I mean, it's changing, though, all the time. But it exists all the time. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. Did anybody catch the other thing that's going on here? I'm going to talk about this at the end today, but. OK, that's, yeah, I don't even, I can't even go there. That's so crazy. What else? Yeah. Virtual particles. Vertical particles, vacuum fluctuations. Oh, we're not going there either. Mind blowing. I mean, in quantum mechanics, stuff actually appears out of nowhere. Out of nothing, you get something, and then it disappears. Those are called vacuum fluctuations, right? What else, though? But it's all related to this. Basically, what he said is that particles can disappear and then reappear somewhere else. And actually, if you take field theory, which I really don't recommend for most people, <laughs> I had a, I still remember my final exam in field theory. It was 90 pages long. It was a 24-hour take-home exam. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I still remember asking my field theory teacher in graduate school, why, um, how can that be? How can a particle disappear? Because basically, when you get down to it, that's pretty much how things move at the very smallest scales. They disappear, and then they reappear. That's what the math tells us, at least. How can that be? Right? I didn't get an answer. <laughs> they don't, these, <laughs> these, this gets like deep, right? It's really cool and really mind-blowing, and we just don't really know. We don't connect it so much anymore in the classrooms to the mind-blowing awesomeness of it all. But I love it. Okay? Now, I'll get to that towards the end. I'll talk, come back to that. Okay? Um, now, what we need, so we have these waves. We know that particles are waves and waves are particles. And we know that the particles we care about in this part of the class are going to have to be described by a wave. How do we talk? What's the F equals MA of that wave? It's dictated by, it's the Schrodinger equation. That's, that's it. That's our F equals MA. It's telling us how this wave is going to change in time and space. Um, and so we talked about that, and, and, and we basically um, just wrote this down and said, this is the equation. We're not going to go into sort of the details of where it comes from, but um, there's so many places where you can read more about that. But this is our governing equation. Um, and basically, what you have is a kind of kinetic energy of the wave. That's this del squared thing, kinetic energy operator, and a potential. And that, together, we call H. We call the Hamiltonian. That's got its own special name. Okay? Because just like T plus V in classical physics is the energy, we consider this thing, H squared over 2M del squared plus V, to be the energy. That's H. But it has to act on the wave function. 
in order to get that energy. And that's basically what the Schrodinger equation is. Because we said, well, we're going to say that H doesn't depend on time usually for the things we care about. And if it doesn't depend on time, then we can get rid of the T here. Okay? And we could separate the time dependence out, which is what we do. And we're left with um, H psi equals E psi, okay? which is the equation we need to solve. And I'll come back to it in a second. Here's the, the bit on Schrodinger I mentioned that I think is amazing. This is, again, from Wikipedia. Um, you see, he found the standing waves. See, there it is. So Schrodinger, see, he found the standing waves of this relativistic equation, but the relativistic corrections disagreed with Sommerfeld's formula. Discouraged, he put away his calculations and secluded himself in an isolated mountain cabin with a lover. <laughs> I find it amazing, uh, not, the, not that part, but I find it amazing that he actually Seriously, he had to be convinced. See, he came back from the cabin, and he decided that his earlier calculations were novel enough to publish. It's a good thing. <laughs> it's like pretty much one of the most important equations of the, the last century. Um, and um, and, and it's, the, it's the equation we will be solving. That's why I think this history is, is interesting. OK, so there it is. So we, have, we talked about how you can take the f out um, because you if, it's, if h doesn't depend on time, then you can just set them equal to a constant. right? You can set each side having its own function dependent on its own variable, r and t in this case, and they equal a constant. And then you get the Schrodinger equation we care about, which is the one we'll be solving, which is h psi equals e psi. Okay? Now, uh, and then we did this. And we said, well, how do you solve it? Well, OK, what if you have a very simple particle in a box, and the box walls go up to infinity, right? then you can solve it. And it's because you have basically the particle is either between 0 and L, in which case here, v, then v is 0. Okay, And so you get this equation. Or it's, at, it's, it's out here in this region, in which case v is infinity, which means psi has to be 0. This is the only solution. Okay, and then so when you so this is sort of the interesting part, and when you look at this, you see that this, the general solution is sines and cosines. So we did that, but then there was the very important thing that happened. What what is it? So and, oh, and you get a solution for e. Once you say the general solution, you get a solution for e. So this is just a standing wave, and you get a solution for e, which depends on k squared. But what's really important that we did next? And that does this, yes, and what did that do? Quantizes. It makes it, once you have the boundary conditions, it limits what this can be. It, we didn't limit it until we applied the boundary conditions. Then we applied the boundary conditions, and boom, this thing is quantized. And out from that drops such a relief for the world, which can exist for more than 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Right? Because that quantization is, in fact, the answer. It's that those electrons can only be at certain energies. They cannot, they cannot radiate energy off of the atom and spiral to the middle because they can't be at another energy except the one that's in and then the next one. Right? Um, and it's real. I, I think I may have shown this uh, la on Tuesday that you can actually visualize these um, the spatial extent of the orbitals, and I put some more. Um, you know, this is actually cutting edge research. Visualizing the shape of electrons is not easy, but it can be done. There's been some really uh, phenomenal uh, breakthrough experiments. This was in Scientific American a decade ago. Now, I want to move from particle in a box to real stuff, and and the first real stuff that's that's relevant is hydrogen. And it is actually, it's only one element. And I sort of mentioned last time that it's not necessarily useful enough to do, say, materials engineering. Um, and so you'd like to have a little bit more of the periodic table. That's true. But you'll see that with hydrogen alone, we get our answers to so many questions about the whole periodic table. Okay. And it's a, it is a real useful material. How much of the universe is made of hydrogen? Does anybody know? How much? That's a really good guess. It's about 75%. That's a lot of hydrogen. Now, 
how much of that is in usable form on Earth for, hydro for the hydrogen economy? How much hydrogen is usable for hydrogen power cars on this planet right now in immediate form? Zero. Zero. That's part one of the hydrogen economy problem. You got to make the hydrogen. There isn't any more, right? It's too light. This, this, this planet's gravity couldn't hold it. So anything that was free left or bonded to something else. You got to make the hydrogen, right? What's part two of the hydrogen economy problem? Storing, Storing it. So you got two big problems with the hydrogen economy. Doesn't, I'm not saying it's not worth looking at. Um, we will not be driving around this way. Um, <laughs> but um, I love, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about hydrogen. I just, I love being a little, I love motivating the topic we're about to go into. And um, since I want to talk about the hydrogen atom, I will talk a little more about hydrogen storage materials. And we will calculate some properties of them using quantum mechanics. Um, but I love this. The history of hydrogen is a very interesting one. But I love going back to Jules Verne. In 1874, Jules Verne said, I believe that one day hydrogen and oxygen with together form water will be used either alone or together as an inexhaustible source of heat and light. I love that. Anyway, we're not there. Not even close. I think you know, a hydrogen economy is a possibility. Um, and I think there's, there's some great research going on. And it should stay as research for at least another 30, 40 years. I'll come back to, um, it's going to need about that much research to really make an impact in the energy climate, energy scene. Um, I'll come back to that later. So here, so that's a little motivation for hydrogen. Now here it is. Hydrogen has a proton and electron, and it's got some distance that that electron sits away from the proton. What do I need to know? Well, I, I need to know the potential, right? So what's the potential here between these two charges? One's negative, one's positive. They feel an attraction. How does it go with R? Yeah. It goes as 1 over R, right? So now that, I got it. I got my V. I got my V. It's the, the potential that charges feel. And that's got to go now into the Schrodinger equation, which I then need to solve. And that'll tell me what the wave functions, the possible wave functions are. Okay. And so here's what it looks like. See, we had h psi equals e psi. That's our master equation. Then we said, well, that's the kinetic plus potential. And then we said, OK, that's the momentum term, remember? Talked about Tuesday, um, which is just a second derivative. It's a second partial derivative. It's a del squared. And plus this potential term, which I now put in here explicitly for the hydrogen atom. Okay? E squared over four, 4 pi epsilon naught r. And that's the equation I need to solve. And it turns out that you can solve this exactly. You can solve this exactly just like you could the particle in the box in, with the infinite boundaries. And that's really cool, right? So you got an electron. You got one particle, just one electron. These are, these are its spatial coordinates. And you can solve for it in this potential, in this 1 over r potential. Exactly. And the easy way to do that is to switch it to spherical coordinates. So I won't go through the math in detail. There's literally like 100 sites and 50 Wolfram Alpha apps you can look at you know, that go through this and really, really wonderful material on this. Um, but basically, the, the key point is that when you, when you write it in spherical coordinates, you switch from you know, x, y, z Cartesian to spherical coordinates, you can actually um, separate this into you know, essentially three quantized problems, theta, um, r, and, and phi. And you see, so you can write psi now as a function of the r and a function of the theta and a function of the phi. And what ends up happening, and then so you put that in, and there's a little bit of math. It's actually not that much. I'm not going to go through it. Um, 
But you put that in, and basically just like that particle in the box, just like that, each one of these variables gets quantized. It gets its, its own sort of E type term, and it gets a quantization, OK? So these are, those, these, are, these are the equations that it leads to when you do the separation of variables. And I think I have, yes, and the quantization um, is, I think maybe on the next page I have the actual energies. But the solution, remember, just like the quantization of a particle in a box, the same here. It only can happen. You can only have a solution if, in this case, we're going to have a quantum number called n is 1, 2, 3, or something else going up. Or in this case, we'll have a quantum number called L. That's also, by the way, the main quantum number, the orbital quantum number. And then we have this little m sub L, which is the magnetic one. How many of you have not seen these? So you've all seen these? How many of you have seen these? OK, so I'm glad to see all the hands go up. Um, OK, and so that's what you have. And it's a very special case. And how many of you remember that S stands for sharp? See, I forget that. Seriously, how many, did you all remember this? Sharp principle and diffuse. And I love F, which is fundamental. So what's, I want to know what's fundamental about, what's not fundamental about silicon, which has no F electrons, right? Anyway, I thought that was an interesting label. Um, so you know, this is how we designate from these quantum numbers, which come from just solving the Schrodinger equation for one electron in a 1 over r potential. That's how we get all of these designations that you're used to, s orbitals, p orbitals. Okay, And you see, you get different wave functions. You get these functions, right? These same wiggly functions that I've been showing you you get for different values of these quantum numbers. Okay? And those functions can be plotted in space, right? This is just given those three, uh, given those spherical coordinates and the functions of those, you can plot them. And you see that they make really funny shapes, right? And why is this so why why is this so important? I said it on Tuesday. Why is the funniness of those shapes important? Yeah, because what, what am I looking at? Actually, let's go to the next one. That's kind of fun. What am I looking at here? These are the, this is the 1s orbital of hydrogen, 2s orbital, 3s, 4s. Look at how they're all spheres. They're all spherically symmetric. And then you go to the, to the 2p orbital, and you see that it has a different shape. Right? So its function, its weight, these are wave functions. That's, you know, remember, the wave function is, is what? What's the wave function? Who knows? Does any of you know? If any of you has some ideas, I, you know, this is like an open problem, an open discussion. But what is interesting about these? So these are the wave functions. From that, what can I get? Yeah, if I do what? Square. Square. Right. So these landscapes squared tell me what? where the electron is, right? And that is incredibly important. That's it. Where is that electron? Well, if you are fundamental, as opposed to diffuse, you have some really bizarre places you can be and not be, right? You can't be anywhere where this isn't. That's the point. It's a probability distribution. Okay, it dictates basically all the behavior of materials. It comes from these these distributions. They dictate what materials do and become. Okay, um, now in the hydrogen atom. So 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 what happens? So you get these 
shapes of the size, and then you also get those E's, right? And remember, we solved for the E's, and then we put the boundary conditions on, and then it was quantized, right? And the quantization, the quantization is um, in, in hydrogen, it can be calculated exactly. So the quantization of the energy levels in hydrogen is exactly minus 13.6 over n squared, where n is the principal quantum number. How many of you have seen this? Sort of half, right? So 13.6 eV over n squared is the quantization. That means the first, the energy of an electron in this first orbital, that one up there, if I put an electron in that orbital, its energy is 13, is, is, it's bound to the atom by 13.6 eV. So what does that mean? Yeah? If you give it 13.6 eV or greater, it'll become free? Yeah. That's the ionization energy of that electron. If, but hydrogen, hydrogen has all of these other orbitals accessible to it. Maybe I could put an electron up to another level, like the 2s level. And if I do that, it's all the way up to 3.4. So now it's only bound by 3.4 eV in the atom. And it's, what does that make it? Is it sort of less stable, more stable? It's less stable. So it'd be much more easy to pull it off. Now, do you think that that has something to do with bonding? You better believe it, right? Where electrons sit in energy relative to other electrons in other atoms or in their own atom has everything to do with how things bond together, right? And that bonding is the one that you've been just fitting to like a Leonard Jones potential. Right? You've just been fitting it. All that bonding is what you just, in classical physics, in classical uh, uh, modeling, you have to have some potential form, and all of the intricacies of the bonding get swept up into that. But you can see why that's so much more complicated than that, just by looking at these. Right? Okay. But now, that, that, that series that we just got from a simple particle in a 1 over r potential explains all of, these, um, all of these levels that are observed. So these are, uh, does everybody remember this? And poor number six who didn't get named. But does everybody, where, what are these? When you see these, what does it make you think? Spectral, now, now explain what's happening in the Lyman series. What's happening? And why are they different? Why do I have all these different ones in one series? Yeah, exactly. And if you go up to two and you stop at two, then you have other energies, right? Because it all comes down to then what the differences are, right? To get an electron to go from here to here, you need the difference in these energies. And to go from here to here, you need that difference. No more and no less will do, right? Now, when the electron comes back down, what happens? Does anybody know what happens? It emits light. It gives that energy back out as light. And that's what you see when you look out at these spectral lines, right? So it emits light of exactly this energy. Can it emit light at something else, at a different amount of energy or a different frequency? Because we know for light that the energy is equal to the frequency, right, times a constant. Can it emit light at this frequency? Something in between? Why not? Yeah. It just can't because it's a wave problem that, ha has, that has as its solution quantization, right? And now I come to the question of, well, then how does, so that's what's happening, okay? That's the picture of 
these electrons coming back down and emitting different colors of light and it explains what, what people saw and couldn't understand for so long. This simple solution, mathematical solution, does it all. It really, it really crystallized what was going on and it really confirmed that this is the right way to picture things. The wave equation um, and the Schrodinger equation. Now what's happening when an electron goes from here to here? How does it do that? It cannot go in between. But we know it does do this all the time. We just look out in space and we see it happening all the time, but we can do it here. We can build materials that do this for a living. Where are those electrons going when they go from the 2p to the 1s? Where are they going? Who can tell me? Yeah. I mean, they're all sort of described by a wave function, right? So it has some non-zero probability to be in you know, one place and a non-zero probability to be in another place. And if you like hit it with a photon or something or you know, add some perturbation to your hydrogen atom, then it's going to have a non-zero probability to be in one electro energy level and another. And so yeah. it just sort of ends up falling into one of them. Now, that, that actually works. That is a great. Uh, that is a great interpretation of what's happening. And that actually works, and it even works all the way down to the nucleus. By the way, decay to the nucleus is possible because the, those s orbitals, I was just showing you a slice of them, an isosurface, but they have a non-zero magnitude all the way down to the nucleus. It just won't happen very often, right? Because the probability is so low that it's, it's it's why we have a universe. That if that overlap was more, if the wave function going into the middle, if the wave function, if this is the nucleus and this is the electron, okay, and the wave function of the s orbital looks like this, and it's almost, almost zero, that's why we are alive today. But if this looked more like this, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't make it. There's just too much probability for the electron to decay into the nucleus and, and give off that amount of energy and the atom collapses, right? Um, so, so we should be very thankful to, uh, to quantum mechanics. Now, there are, there are situations though when you actually have nodes in between. And that's a tougher one. The node means the wave function goes exactly to zero. Now what's happening? Right? And here we go back to this world of particles, this field theory world, basically, of how particles move by essentially annihilating themselves and reappearing. Right? That's how electrons really move. OK, now there are some, any, any questions about any of that? No questions at all? OK, there are some, um, we're going to start taking this to the next level, which is, is, is obviously going to have to be more complexity. There are some constants that I'm just putting here. I'm not going to spend any time on it, but you know, these are the constants you'll be using in the quantum world, right? We have an electron volt. We have a Rydberg, which is 13.6 electron volts. And just to make it interesting, there's a Hartree, which is a half of that. Um, and then the same with angstroms and Bohr, OK? Um, these are the kinds of units. Do you say angstrom? Do you say Bohr? Tomato, tomato, right? It's sort of like you can choose. But just keep track of it all. Now, as we go to more complex, so I've given you a particle in a box, and then I gave you a particle, actually on Tuesday, in an oscillator, and then I gave you a particle in a 1 over r. And that got us a long way. We explained the spectral lines. We got hydrogen right. Um, but if I just add a little bit more complexity, you see, things get really messy. Now, this was a problem. I, I wanted to show how messy things get with analytic solutions as a kind of motivational 
exercise. So I gave this on a homework problem in this class two years ago. And what and I I'll admit that was probably a mistake. <laughs> but it was kind of, you know, <laughs> I had a lot of people at office hours. Um, because you see, this is the same thing. I'm throwing my quantum mechanical ball into a wall that has another wall behind it. Right? So can't you just set it up? Well, sure, you can. And this is what you get. And you put that into Mathematica, which every single student did, and it chokes. Can't do it. Too many, or MATLAB, too many, um, you know, I guess too many boundary conditions or too many variables or something. But nobody could get Mathematica to do this without some intelligent substitution of variables first, which was sort of the trick. But my point in this was not to make students suffer. I don't like to do that. But it was just to convey how hard this equation gets to solve with just a little bit more complexity than one particle in a well or in a 1 over r or something like that. Right? It gets really hard. And that's why we need computers. Right? And that's what computation in the last 50 years has done. It has made this together with some algorithms, some, some simplifications that you'll hear about, it has made this equation solvable for much more complex systems. Okay? So I mean, you know, I can also say, well, let's not make the potential more complicated. Let's just add another electron. Okay? So now I'm, I'm still with a 1 over r potential, but I've got two of them. Okay, so now all of a sudden, my potential term is these, these electrons interacting with the proton, but also those electrons interacting with each other. That's R12, the distance between the two electrons, right? And boy, does that make this equation hard to solve analytically. You cannot use separation of variables, right? So even just one more electron, just it's a deal breaker, basically. Right? And now you think we want to do you know, big molecules. We want to do fullerenes. We want to do silicon. Right? We want to do thousands of electrons. Analytic approaches won't work. Okay? Um, so what can you do? Well, there are sort of two different ways to go. Um, you got to do something. <laughs> you got to make it easier. Because, as you'll see, an exact solution, even with the most powerful computers in the world times squared, are not going to do it. You need to make approximations to the actual equation. And you'll hear about those next week. Um, and you know, one thing you can do is you can use perturbation theory to say that this Hamiltonian is actually some simpler Hamiltonian. Okay, That Hamiltonian is some simpler Hamiltonian that you can solve easily plus some perturbation to it. Okay, we're not we're not going to really do that. Is it? Is anybody use perturbation theory? So we're not going to do it much. But I'm just saying it for reference. And then, um, right? So you do something for something. You, with perturbation theory, what you do is you say, well, that's hard, so I'm not going to do that. But this is actually kind of related, and it's easy, and I know how to do this. So I'll do this, and then add something to it. That's basically perturbation theory, OK? Um, but what we're going to do is um, we're going to try to solve it using um, more of a matrix eigenvalue approach. And again, we are not going to go deep into the math here. And you will not be tested on the math, OK? Um, as I said, my, my goal here is to have you guys applying these, these equations to real materials problems. Um, but I do think that it's useful to know what's under the hood, to know what equations are being solved when you press simulate. Okay? So you'll hear more about this um, and, and how you go about actually making these approximations, making the approximations you need to make in order to get a, an, a a, an, an eigenvalue problem that can be solved on a computer. There are a couple different ways to do that. The way that we're going to sort of settle on in this class is density functional theory. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And again, that's the only Nobel Prize in computation was given for that, the, the development of that theory. Okay. 
Now, there's one more thing I need to talk about um, before I, I, I move to just a couple of examples online that I'd like to show you. And that is that there's something still missing here. So we got, we got uh, let's see. We got this um, 1s. So now we sort of know where these things come from. We really know where they come from, the solution to the, the hydrogen atom. 2p, 3s, right, and so on. Um, and then, like, hydrogen would be what? How would I show hydrogen here? Put an arrow there. What would helium be? One more. OK, tell me carbon. I like carbon. Carbon is right here. It hits me in the heart every time. How many, how many more? And then what? Two up. Two up. Oh, why not like this? No? It just feels wrong. Exclusion. Yeah. Well, now we're talking. You, just, you guys already kind of have a feeling for this. Oh, but actually, you can have materials that violate someone's rule. Anyone know what that rule is called? Well, actually, this doesn't violate poly exclusion. Hun's rule. Very good. Whoever pulled that one out, that was good. But this is how carbon usually looks, right? Now, something that we've done here is we've already done what I'm about to tell you, which is we've put spin in there. We've put those electrons pointing up or down, right? But we also have those quantum numbers. This is n and equals 1. This is n equals 2, and this is and, and l equals 0. L equals 0. And this is p. So this is n equals 2, l equals 1. And each one of these is an m. m equals plus or minus 1 and 0. Right? So that's why I have three p's. Right? So those are those quantum numbers you get from quantizing the solution to the Schrodinger equation for an electron in a in a 1 over r potential. But there's this one more thing, which is, was also very surprising at the time, which is that you know, if you put a, a particle, in this case silver atoms, if you think about electrons as charges spinning, well, you, you should have a reaction to a magnetic field. They should have a magnetic moment. right? And, but classically, you see, if you have charge spinning, you get a magnetic field. Classically. If you shoot this through a really large magnet, you should just get a whole range of lines of fields. But just like the double slit, it didn't turn out that way. You got two dots instead, only two dots. right? And these are very famous. These are the Stern-Gerlach experiments, which were done all around the same time. They were figuring all this out. And what it showed is that the spin can only be up or down. It can only be two things. There's only two values for the spin of an electron. The spin being the thing that's causing this thing to have a magnetic moment that's causing it to react to the external magnetic field. You should get a, a line. You should get all this. They, you know, classically, electrons should have any spin they want. I don't know what that was. But you know, it should be able to point in any direction. But no. It can only point this way or this way. Now, is an electron really spinning? So if, it, if a charge is spinning, it has a magnetic moment, right? But is an electron really spinning? How does it have a magnetic moment? Let's talk. That's a really good one, too, right? But it does. And you think about it as spinning because that is our classical Maxwell, right? sort of e &M framework. We think about charge spinning. You've done it. You put a charge, you know, you, you, you make current go through a wire, and you get a field, right? Um, and that's why we use the word spin. You know, it's sort of like orbital. Should we really be using the word orbital? Is this electron orbiting? No. And that's another ice-breaking question. You go to your friend, and you just say, do you think electrons are really orbiting? Just like that. And see how many people say yes. They are not, they kind of are spinning in our minds. But the spin 
is up or down because of those experiments. Now, then the sort of end of the story, OK, so they, 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 they have a magnetic moment, right? And it gives them up and down. And then, um, and they can only be up and down, only up and down. Two values. And so what you have is sort of a new quantum number, right? You have spin, which is equal to plus or minus 1. That's that and that, OK? So now each of these, and that's why with these collections of quantum numbers, you can get that many electrons into those shells. Now I love this. So you, somebody said Pauli exclusion. Somebody tell me what the Pauli exclusion principle is. Yeah. Two fermions can't be in the same state. Okay. So two electrons, we'll just say, which are fermions, cannot be in the same state. And what do you mean by the same state? The so they can't be they can't be in sort of the same you know energy shell with the same spin, you know at the same time. Okay, very good. Basically, what it means is they cannot have the exact same quantum numbers. You cannot. It says Pauli exclusion says you cannot do this. Now I, I mentioned you can violate Hund's rule, and you can violate Hund's rule by having like degenerate orbitals with the same energy and doing it there. OK? But usually you don't. Pauli exclusion is an incredibly important aspect of quantum mechanics. It says that no two electrons, fermions, can occupy the same set of quantum numbers when you include spin. That is what gives us, literally, the periodic table in all of chemistry when you add that to quantum mechanics. That is what gives us the rest, OK? That plus the hydrogen atom. You don't need much more, except you do. <laughs> but I love this letter from Thomas to Gutzmitt on, on, um, in 1926. I think you and Ullenbeck, because they're the ones that uh, discovered this stuff, have, you know, in working out sort of the theory, have been very lucky to get your spinning electron published and talked about before Pauli heard of it. It appears that more than a year ago, Kronig believed in the spinning electron and worked out something. The first person he showed it to was Pauli. Pauli ridiculed the whole thing so much that the first person became also the last. And no one else heard anything of it, which all goes to show that the infallibility of the deity does not extend to his self-styled vicar on Earth. <laughs> so Pauli had an interesting reputation. <laughs> but I thought, that is amazing to me because this is it, right? This is like one of the foundations of the Pauli exclusion principle. So Pauli built his whole reputation and really made an important contribution because of what apparently he didn't really believe in at first. So it goes to show, keep an open mind, right? Uh, OK. So that's what, what, that's what we just said, right? Can't have the same quantum numbers. Got to mix up the quantum numbers, and that's it. And that is it, you see? Because now we had all these levels from the hydrogen atom solution, an electron, a one electron in a simple one over our potential. And we got all those levels. And now all we need to do is fill them up, right? And with the Pauli exclusion principle, we know the rules. We know the rules. We know we can only put two electrons here. We know we can only put uh, two electrons in S and six electrons in P, so eight here. We know we can only put two, six, and how many in, in D? Ten. Because ten has m goes from minus two to plus two, so five, right? I mean, D has that. So that's starting to sound a whole lot like this. That's it, right? Essentially, with that, with those fundamental principles that were worked out in the 20s and the solution of the hydrogen atom, you get essentially all of the periodic table. It's really powerful. It's pretty darn cool. Okay? And, and you can connect, um, as I said, back to the spectral lines and, and all of that. Now, what I want to spend the last um, couple of minutes on is I want to... 
I wanted to show you, has anybody um, looked at the quantum part? You guys are still doing homework from the last part, right? Um, so on the Nano Hub, there is, so you go, you go to the Nano Hub and you go to, uh oh, sorry, I should have checked this. Oh, there I am. That's amazing. That's a picture from like, oh, I won't say how long ago. That's embarrassing. Um, now, so you go, this is my thing, my personal thing, but anyway, the tool you want is this one. And it has a little star next to it. That's so exciting. It's called the MIT Atomic Scale Modeling Toolkit, formerly known as the Berkeley Atomic Scale Modeling Toolkit, <laughs> since I developed it at Berkeley. Ah, so much for that, but it's now MIT. And if you click that, these are actually tools I developed for a class I, I made up at, when I was at Berkeley, when I valued sunshine over science. And um, does it say that? And you can launch it, and you'll see that, um, at, oh, and you can rate it a 10. Don't rate it anything else. But please rate it a 10. <laughs> or don't rate it. <laughs> Everybody's so star-driven these days, number of stars. But you see, what is that? You know, there's this whole, there was an NPR piece the other day about how there's this whole business opportunity sprouting up of people who have companies where the, all they do is they get your number of stars for your products high. So they, they have people around the world because you got to do it from different places and you got to kind of write fake reviews of products, right? And have different, you know, Google, fake Google email addresses. Blowing me away, this so called internet. Now, you look here, and you see that there are actually, in this MIT Atomic Scale Modeling Toolkit, there are many things. There are many things. We will be using two tools from this, OK? One, and both are quantum mechanical tools. One is going to be games, which is a quantum chemistry package. It's free. You can download it and run it on your laptop, actually. Um, and it's for molecules and atoms. And another is going to be um, called Siesta. So you play games, you take a siesta. <laughs> and this one, we're going to use when we, work, when we do solids. Okay? Both of them are going to use a, a, an approximation called density functional theory to solve the Schrodinger equation for real materials. So let's just take in the last few minutes of class, let's take a look at games. And you can see, why is it letting me, it's not letting me scroll down. Seriously? Oh. Is that, there's my scroll bar there? OK. So the input is actually pretty straightforward. So you can calculate the energy or you can optimize it. The method is going to be DFT, density functional theory. The basis set is something you'll learn about on Tuesday, what that is. OK? But pick like medium. And then I want to not have a solvent, but I want to plot these orbitals. And then um, my thing, it, it, it disappeared again. Don't you guys love the Nano Hub? It's so bug free. And now it's not, it's not dragging. That's great. So what you can do is you can do new. And let's do like the carbon atom, my favorite one. OK? And I'm going to, you can, do you guys know about XYZ coordinates? Right? So you put the number of atoms in the top line. You leave the next line blank or you write whatever you want. Um, and well, yeah, don't let me see some of the things you might write. I don't know. And then you put the atoms with their XYZ positions. So carbon is going to be at the origin, and we click Simulate. And it's doing it. That's it. It just solved the Schrodinger equation for carbon, something you couldn't do for a million years. No, for 50 years, analytically. And it just did it. OK? And now it's still tight. <laughs> executing a script which is very frustrating. Is it this slow for you guys? This is one atom. Man. Um, OK. Well, so we go back to here. One thing you got right there is you got those energy levels, which I can't scroll down to look at. Ugh. This is so amazingly. Frustrating. <laughs> OK, so now what I'm going to do, since it's not, <laughs> it's not working, 
is I'm going to try it again. And I'm going to do, um, I'll pick a different basis, low. See if that works. And I just did, I just did the Schrodinger equation for carbon. <laughs> got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. Really? Like, seriously? Let's try a different atom. Let's try, somebody give me an atom. Boron. All right. This is going to be lucky. This is going to do it. Oh, yeah. It's not able to do it. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Let me just try one more thing. I'm going to try um, putting two atoms in. Let's see if that helps. Yeah. And we'll optimize it. Yeah, now it is, it is a party. Oh. Hey? OK, but did it, did it give me the orbitals? No. Didn't give me the orbitals. Hang on. Sorry, guys. Oh, it's, it's like still here. Um, let's just see if it gave me the orbitals. OK, there they are. Ah, OK, this is it. <laughs> Sorry. It was Firefox, which I never use. But it came to the rescue for this one. So look at this. OK, just really quickly, because if you want to play with this, this will just take one minute to show, OK? There, I did the carbon dimer. I, that's like a lot of electrons, right? And it just solved it because of what you're going to learn on Tuesday, the approximations. It just solved it. And look, you can, if you right click on top of the image, you get surfaces, and then you get orbitals. And look at that. That is actually, what do you think those two are? There are two carbon atoms here. The, the S's. Those are those one S's, right? Together in the dimer. And these are now the two S and P's all bonding together. And you want to know how they look? Well, here's like the, here's like one of those S's. There it is. It's an S orbital in the dimer, though. And it looks very much like the atomic S orbital, which it should. Why? It's, remember, those are the ones we don't care about. They don't really do anything when you bond. It's all about the other ones, like, for example, um, one of these P's, right? Those are, that's it. That's the solution to the Schrodinger equation for the carbon dimer. And that's where that P-type orbital, that's where the electron in that level sits. Now, this is no longer an atom. You can do it for the carbon atom and see the P orbitals and the S orbitals. But now when you make a molecule, things get more complicated, right? And more and more complicated, right? So that'll be the tool we use for our molecule things, assuming it actually works. And um, if anyone has any questions, um, email me. And remember, class next Tuesday, but not next Thursday. <laughs>